So then it's perfect. All right. All right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to our international ground rounds. I'm very glad. I'm very delighted to have a guest speaker today, Hello. Professor Witzke Falkins. Good morning, Professor. Good morning, Puya. Don't say professor. <laughs> You're <a> terrible so, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, just a brief introduction for uh, those who are interested. Uh, Wiske Falkins uh, is, uh, is a professor at the Department of Otolaryngology at the Academic Medical Center in Amsterdam, and she is the chairman of the European position paper on rhinosinusitis and nasal polyposis uh, called EPOS. And today, she is going to summarize some new updates in regards to the EPOS guidelines, uh, in regards to the new update on 2020. And uh, this could be done directly from her. So I suggest for all the attendants to type your question and we will reply, we will ask those questions to Wiske directly at the end of our uh, discussion. So for those who are interested, please type your um, question now. Please, Wiske, if you can share your screen. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much Pia, for this uh, uh, invitation and possibility to uh, talk about EPOS. Um, it's close to my heart. I can't uh, talk enough about it. Uh, and I'm very happy uh, that uh, another audience will uh, listen to the update on EPOS 2020 that I would like to give to you. Um, I can't... I... Um, no, Buya, I can't uh, move forward my slides. Oh, uh, let me try. There's something going on. <clears throat> because I, I apparently don't have the, I'm not allowed. Oh yeah, I, I put you as a co-host, so I don't know what's one. Can no, you but... try once again? Nope. Uh, can you give me the possibility for uh, use the remote control? Yeah. Thank you. Try. I think you have it. Yes. Yeah, okay, exactly. Okay. So I just say next. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Good. So EPOS uh, started in um, somewhere 2003, 4 in that period when uh, Ayaki asked me to uh, uh, write a position paper on rhinosinusitis. Um, and uh, EPOS, the name was actually uh, thought of by Peter Hellings, who was then a fellow with me. And um, you can see here that we had a number of updates, first in seven, then in 2012. And I can assure you that it's a massive amount of work. So after 2012, many people asked me, when is there, will there be a new EPOS? But the, the EPOS steering group felt there wasn't enough new data, but now in the last year or two, of course, we have an, a tremendous increase in uh, new uh, ideas and new data. And for that reason, we now made the new update EPOS uh, 2020. Here you see the, um, uh, um, the authors of EPOS 2020 and a picture of the steering group. Uh, we came together three times to discuss because of course it's not only collecting data but also discussing and how to interpret it, the data and uh, this was in Leiden in uh, November 2019 and you see that there's a large group of people uh, that were involved in the um, uh, as authors and also uh, an even larger group of people who helped to uh, review the whole document and disseminate it all over the world. Uh, this group consisted of not only of ENT surgeons, but pulmonologists, allergologists, um, GPs, uh, pharmacists, immunologists, microbiologists, uh, neur neurologists, and of course, maybe most important patients were part of it and helped us to define what is important for them in the management of their disease. Here you see the content page of EPOS. Uh, it is uh, 464 pages and you can imagine that it's absolutely impossible to summarize that in 30 minutes, but um, it's free for everybody to download. And I will show you at the end the um, reference to the download on the Rhinology website and there is also a 
specific website for EPOS 2020. Um, what I would like to discuss today are some highlights. So what is EPOS? We discussed that just a little bit about acute rhinosinusitis, pathophysiology, mainly of chronic, the new classification of chronic rhinosinusitis, how to understand different forms of uh, rhinosinusitis and how we thought a better classification can help us in the management of the disease, something about diagnosis, and finally, of course, the evidence-based treatment and new management schemes. <coughs> I'm sorry, and we'll, you will hear some coughing today. That's inevitable in this COVID time. Um, I hope this is a clear um, text for everybody because it's the clin clinical definition of chronic rhinosinusitis in adults, and it has not changed since the beginning of EPOS very important to emphasize that there should be inflammation of the nose and paranasal sinuses, and there should be either nasal blockage or nasal discharge. If you see a patient with just facial pain and it doesn't have any nasal symptoms, the chance that it's actually chronic rhinosinusitis, it's very, very limited. And we want to see endoscopic signs of disease, so either polyps or mucopurulin di discharge or uh, mucosal obstruction in the middle meatus and or CT changes. And for chronic rhinosinusitis, these symptoms have to be present for at least 12 weeks, three months. And if you look at the right side at the right cartoon, I hope you can see my mouse. You can see the prevalence of uh, these cardinal symptoms of chronic rhinosinusitis. Here totally on the left, an unselected group of patients in primary care well, you see about 10% of, of the population have symptoms of rhinitis anyway, which is of course not unlogical. These are the patients with allergic rhinitis or non-allergic rhinitis, 20% have nasal obstruction. But as soon as we look at typical CRS groups here in the general population and then going eventually to patient in an outpatient ENT clinic or undergoing surgery, and here we divide it between patients with and without nasal polyps, you see that 80, the 60 to 90% of the pa uh, patients actually have these typical symptoms of chronic rhinosinusitis. And you can also see that there are small differences in the patients with nasal polyps, for example, 90% have smell loss. In the patients with, um, without nasal polyps, that's about 70%. Uh, in the patient without nasal polyps, you see a little bit more facial pain than in the with, but you can also see that there is a large significant overlap between these two groups, which has also been shown in other studies. Let's have a short look at the definition of acute rhinosinusitis. And I keep emphasizing that now already for about 10 years because we have a significant problem with the use of antibiotics. And especially in the south of Europe, I see Puya nodding, uh, that is a, a, a real issue. But also in countries like Belgium, for example, in many uh, countries in the uh, in Eastern, in Asia, and also in the US. Um, so it's important to realize that every acute rhinosinusitis or almost every acute rhinosinusitis starts with a common cold. And that's the reason we call a common cold a viral acute rhinosinusitis. It's an inflammation of the nose and sinuses. It has the symptoms that are correct characteristics of rhinosinusitis and it is caused by a virus. A typical example of a common cold is uh, increasing symptoms for a few days, declining symptoms, and by about a week, the symptoms are gone. But there is a group of patients who keep having symptoms for longer than 10 days, or actually um, uh, incur have a, an increase in their symptoms after five days. And these patients have acute rhinosinusitis that is not viral anymore, but it's definitely also not bacterial. And for that reason, we called it post-viral acute rhinosinusitis. So it's an inflammatory response, post-viral, not caused by bacteria. 
a very tiny group of patients actually have an acute bacterial rhinosinusitis. And within EPOS, we defined these characteristics as needed for having an acute bacterial rhinosinusitis, at least three of these. High fever, uh, double sickening, so being better first and becoming worse again. Unilateral disease, usually severe pain and raised ESR or CRP. And if you see in this cartoon, uh, you see here a dot for um, bacterial rhinosinusitis, and that dot is even maybe 10 times too large. So we all have a few common colds every year. Two to four is normal in adults. Quite often patients have a post-viral rhinosinusitis afterwards, which can, can last a number of weeks after the common cold, but very few of them actually have an acute bacterial rhinosinusitis. And only those with bacterial disease can benefit from antibiotics. And here in EPOS 2020, for the first time, we divided the studies that are available, available in patients with uh, acute bacterial and um, uh, uh, post-viral rhinosinusitis. And here you see the first plots for antibiotics <clears throat> uh, in acute bacterial rhinosinusitis for cure at completion of the intervention. That was between day six and 10. And you see there is a significant effect, very significant and a real effect that favors antibiotics. And here you see the same for improvement at day three, uh, three of the treatment. Again, a significant, a little bit less than the cure, but still a significant uh, and relevant effect. However, if we look at antibiotics in post-viral acute rhinosinusitis, you see something totally different. You can see here that the uh, uh, that it crosses the, the one. Uh, this is the uh, Antibiotics versus placebo for cure again, uh, 10 to 14 days after the intervention. And you see here also the chance 0.106 uh, and not, and having the one inside. So no significant effect of antibiotics in post viral acute rhinosinusitis. And again, here we looked at different things. Here was the cure at 10 to 14 days. Here was the mean difference in number of days to achieve cure. So are you better earlier? Well, again, the answer is no. And here, is there a faster improvement? So uh, studies looking at day three after starting the treatment. And again, you can see no significant effect. So extremely important to realize you cannot help your patient with acute post-viral rhinosinusitis by giving them antibiotics. You only give them side effects, but they are not better any day earlier. On the contrary, if you look at the studies using intranasal steroids uh, and an anti-inflammatory treatment that you can expect uh, to be potentially helpful in an inflammatory reaction after viruses, uh, here you can see uh, the change from baseline of the total symptom score, you see a significant reduction. <coughs> I'm sorry, in this uh, graph, I, uh, I changed steroids and placebo, it's the wrong way around. So a significant effect um, of um, uh, treatment with nasal steroids on the total, signals, um, uh, total symptom score, and that was the case for studies where they used a single treatment of nasal steroids only, but also if it was added to an antibiotic. But as I said before, an antibiotic per se doesn't have any effect. So this is all an effect of uh, nasal steroids. So significant effect on the symptomatology. Again, no effect on the duration of the disease, only on the amount of symptoms. At least that was the only data we could find. Well, why is that so important? That's, and here I show data from Europe because we are very diverse in our management in Europe, but the same is true for all over the world. Here is a graph of the consumption of antibiotics 
uh, in the community in 30 EU countries. And you see very nicely here on top of the Netherlands. That's of course why I show this living here in the Netherlands. And you see here totally at the bottom, Italy, Belgium, France, Greece, Romania, uh, about twice as much, two, uh, three, two, two to three times as much use of antibiotics uh, in the south of Europe compared to the Netherlands, Estonia and Sweden. If you then look at the percentage of res macrolide resistance, you see exactly the same figure. Green here for Scandinavia, uh, the Netherlands, Denmark, uh, very orange and red here in the south. So there is a clear correlation be between the uh, prescription of antibiotics and resistance, as we all know, and what we probably do not all know, most of the antibiotics prescribed in Europe are prescribed for airway disease, for upper and lower airway disease. So we can make a significant contribution in reducing the amount of antibiotic resistance in Europe by not prescribing antibiotics anymore for acute post-viral viral sinusitis. And of course, it takes more time to explain a patient what is the problem and to explain why the antibiotics doesn't help. And I often hear colleagues saying, well, if I don't prescribe, the, the, he will go, the patient will go to my neighbor who will do, but I think that's a very bad argument. We should stop that and take our responsibility and stop pres uh, prescribing antibiotics. If we do that, uh, these are the care pathways that we made in EPOS 2020. And a, a, a very bad thing of um, uh, involving everybody and having everything in one graph from self-care and pharmacy to tertiary care is that these these schemes become more and more complicated. The good news is that you can take out the part you're uh, specifically interested in. So here on the top is self-care and the pharmacy. So of course we want to check that the patient doesn't have serious uh, bacterial disease, but otherwise self-care, and you can read here what can be done, decongestions, uh, painkillers, herbal medicine, zinc, vitamin C. If you want to see all the evidence, it's all, you can find it in EPOS. And again, avoid antibiotics. If patients see their primary care physician, he does the same. He checks for acute bacterial rhinosinusitis. He checks whether it's post-viral. And again, emphasizes appropriate medical treatment and avoiding antibiotics. And very few of those patients um, eventually are referred to us, to secondary and tertiary care, most of the time because they have um, uh, alarm symptoms which could point to uh, a complication of the disease. Let's look at the pathophysiology of chronic rhinosinusitis because that's of course what is our daily life. Um, here you see an important way of thinking about uh, pathogenesis. It's important to realize that both host and environment have their influence on the endotype. Uh, barrier penetration seems to be an important part of the host response. The endotype results in remodeling and finally in a certain phenotype, what we see in our daily practice. And of course, we all know that the upper airways and lower airways have a very clear correlation. So whenever we see phenotype of rhinosinusitis, we have to realize that the, the patient probably also have a lower airway problem. What is new in our thinking and really starts to become extremely important because it is going to be decisive in which treatment we are actually giving to these patients is what type of inflammation does the patient actually have? Um, and for a long time, these sort of graphs was the thing ENT surgeons hated, you know? Uh, Aldo Stamm from Brazil once said to me, oh, these terrible arrow people, you know? They put arrows everywhere. And I don't understand. I don't want to understand anything about arrows, but we can't do without arrows anymore. We have to understand something about it. 
And one of the things I think you really have to understand is the difference between type one, type two, and type three inflammation. And if that's still too much, remember type two inflammation becomes really, really important in treatment later. And typical type two inflammation, you see here an example with lots of arrows, but you see also one very important cell and that's the eosinophil. Remember that eosinophils play an important role in type two inflammation. Uh, and you can see here lots of other cell, uh, lots of other cells important here, the innate lymphocyte cells that react to directly to the epithelium. And you see a number of cytokines that are, are important, R5, R4, and 13, and IgE. If you remember those, they come back later. Let's look at the new classification of chronic rhinosinusitis. sinusitis. For many years, this was how we thought about it, the phenotyping of CRS with or without nasal polyps. But if we, do, if we talked a little bit with people, of course, we all realized that this was an enormous simpl simplification of the truth. We all know that not all nasal polyps are just nasal polyps. We know that we have kiddos with cystic fibrosis who have a totally different disease. We know there are patients with church trials that re respond differently. We know certainly in certain parts of the world that there are many patients with fungal disease that are totally different. So almost nasal polyp, but totally different. Also in chronic rhinosinusitis, we know there are patients with biofilm and a lot of other uh, immune deficiencies, a lot of other causes. So we knew that this is far too simple but, and that this is much more what we see in our daily practice. And in the last years, a number of analyses have been done to try to further understand the endotyping of chronic rhinosinusitis. And this is one of those examples uh, but there are many more. Um, and you see here a number of important uh, markers of inflammation. I, I told you earlier already about IL-5 and IgE, but you see a, a, a lot more here, here MPO, IL-6, 8, IL-17. And here um, you see the phenotype. And you can see that uh, here, in, if you, if we, here we divided our patients in, um, in 10 different clusters of disease. And you can see that in some of these clusters, see this is a typical cluster of patients with high uh, IgE and IL-5. You see most of these patients have nasal polyps. Eh? This is the prevalence of, of nasal polyps. So 90% of nasal polyps, more than half have asthma. But you have also here a group of still type 2 disease with IgE and eosinophils. Only half have polyps uh, and a third have asthma. And eventually here on top, most of the patients do not have polyps. And if you take biopsies and endotype these patients, they're usually IL-5 negative, but for example, have an IL-22 or an IL-17 profile. So very many different clusters of disease. If you can remember that most of the patients with nasal polyps have type 2 disease and most of the patients without polyps have non-type 2, that would be helpful. Uh, next, please, uh, Doya. But we all felt that these classifications and clustering was complicated and not easy to explain to people. So we had a long discussion whether we could have a better classification of chronic rhinosinusitis. And this was proposed by Richard Harvey and his team. And he said, well, you know, let's first say that chronic rhinosinusitis can be primary or secondary. Well, what do you mean with that? Well, secondary disease, um, and I'll look at that first, is the, the patients that have CRS but actually have an underlying problem. So the underlying problem can be cystic fibrosis or PCD, can be a tumor, a fungal ball, or um, vaginous disease, eh? GPA or EGPA, or an immune deficiency. Of course, it's absolutely clear for everybody that patients that have CRS based on these sort of diseases should be treated differently from a normal CRS patient. Here, if the patient has cystic fibrosis, we probably want to treat the cystic fibrosis and secondarily, maybe the CRS, but not the other way around. 
if we now look at the oh i can't go back no yeah i can go back if we now look at the primary crs we said well let's first look at the anatomical distribution we can divide our patients between localized disease which is usually unilateral or diffuse bilateral disease then we can divide into type 2 or non-type 2 i explained to you already why is that so important and finally we can then give examples of uh, uh, specific phenotypes and if for example you follow me with a primary crs patient that has a localized problem for example an isolated frontal sinusitis being non-type 2, everybody can understand that that's a patient that needs surgery. And the frontal sinus is blocked. It's a localized problem that we can solve lo locally with surgery. But on the other hand, if we look, look at a patient with um, uh, 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 rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps or a patient with allergic fungal rhinosinusitis, it's a typical type 2 disease. It's everywhere. And we can all understand that treating that inflammation is the key to our success. And surgery can be helpful, but it's definitely not the, 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 uh, the thing that is going to solve the whole problem. So this division into difficult, different anatomical places and endotype dominance helps us to treat the patient in the best way. Well, this I discussed already a little bit, but again, we made the same discussion, uh, division between localized disease or diffuse disease, a local pathology. Huh? If we have an autodontogenic sinus maxillary sinus sinusitis, of course, we're going to treat that teeth problem first. And then secondary, maybe our um, uh, maxillary sinus. Um, on the other hand, if there is a diffuse problem and the patient has a GPA, well, we can tr try whatever we like to get the sinuses better. But if there is no systemic treatment of the GPA, the patient will eventually not be very uh, well taken care of. So this new classification helps us to understand um, the different forms of CRS and has a direct consequence for the way that we uh, manage our patients. Finally, oops, sorry. Finally, uh, within EPOS, um, we spend a lot of time on the diagnosis of CRS. And it's really interesting to see that there are very little data on diagnosis. We all spend our time on analyzing what is the effect of our treatment, but very few data are available how to best diagnose a patient. And for that reason, we used a lot of Delphi questionnaires. That's a way of asking patients uh, or asking our colleagues, and that was a large group of, of uh, the steering group that we asked uh, how they felt about a certain um, diagnosis, for example. And then uh, we said that if we want to have a clear answer for colleagues to help them at least, um, uh, a, a majority of the pair of the group needed a positive answer. So at least um, more than 70% needed a grade to seven of nine, uh, seven to nine, and less than 15% should have a negative answer. Well, here you see two examples of Delphi's that were unclear. If we ask people the question, is it essential? to do a CT of the sinuses at initial presentation to an ENT secondary care if you have highly suggestive symptoms of CRS and abnormality at endoscopy. Half the group that was asked, half the colleagues said, no, that's not necessary. I'm just going to treat the patient. I don't need a CT. And about 40% um, said, uh, yes, I definitely want a CT. Well, you see, that's a, 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 an example of a Delphi that was unclear. So we can't give a, a clear advice to you. Uh, we are not sure what is the best way to go forward. But some of these Delphi's were very clear and showed a clear positive or negative um, advice. And you can find all those 
uh, in EPOS. So again, these are Delphi's. So it's the opinion of opinion leaders, but definitely not data that prove that we are all right. I'll skip this because I see I talk already for 35 minutes uh, and would like the last uh, part of my presentation to talk about the evidence-based treatment. What you can find in EPOS are a large number of these meta-analysis, systematic reviews and meta-analysis. And I showed you already a few for acute rhinosinusitis, sinusitis. And here you see an example of uh, nasal corticosteroids in uh, chronic rhinosinusitis. sinusitis. And I, I hope you're all able now to read these forest plots of meta-analysis, yeah, where usually here you see what the effect is, whether the steroid was better or the placebo was better. And here you can see the size of the effect. So if this is the standard mean difference is 0.3 uh, for regular doses of nasal steroids, so a small effect. Uh, here, the standard mean difference for a high dose of steroids was a relatively large effect. So in this way, you can read all these forest plots. And we did many of those. Here you see the effect of nasal steroids on the proportion of patients with uh, a nasal polyp score reduction. And you can see, for example, that patients uh, that had sinus surgery in the past had a three times better effect of nasal steroids than placebo. If you look at the patient who had, did not have sinus surgery in the past, the effect was only twice as good. So in that way, you can see what the combination of all the data available up to um, January of this year, what the studies tell you. Here is the effect of aspirin treatment after desensitization in patients with uh, NERD, with uh, uh, aspirin intolerance. You see the treatment with aspirin on the uh, SNOT score, a significant effect, twice as good as placebo for the patients treated with aspirin desensitization. Um, here, the effect of uh, aspirin treatment versus standard treatment alone on the symptom score. And again, you see a significant better effect of aspirin versus standard treatment alone. In this way, we went through all the uh, de uh, available data, but some, sometimes it was not possible to do a meta-analysis, but we did look at all the studies here. For example, you see a table of the effect of short-term antibiotics after surgery. I think many of you give antibiotics after surgery. I give antibiotics after surgery. But if you look in the literature, there are actually four studies showing that it doesn't have any effect. So we all give antibiotics because we feel unsure and we, we don't want to see inflammation after surgery. But we look at the studies, and this is in total something like for 500 patients, there's absolutely, absolutely no effect of antibiotics after surgery. So something to start thinking, am I still going to do that? It's not only about uh, medical treatment. There's also a lot in EPOS about other forms of um, uh, analysis. And here, for example, uh, are the studies that looked at reverse Trendelenburg position. So putting the head of the patient up to reduce blood loss during uh, surgery. Quite an important subject. Uh, three studies that all show that it's uh, uh, favorable to put the head up, to um, have a better surgical field quality, to have less blood loss, and to operate faster. So three reasons to take care, to discuss with your anesthetist that you want your patient as high up as possible during surgery, that you still can just reach the head. That's always the problem, especially if you're not so tall. <coughs> Finally, we looked at and defined again, clinical control of disease. And you can find this ta table in EPOS. And why is it important? Because in this way, we try to discuss 
that chronic rhinosinusitis is not a disease in general that we're going to cure, just like asthma, but it's a disease that we want to control. We want to have the least possible symptoms and the least possible inflammation with uh, the least possible treatment. And in this way, here we defined controlled, partly controlled and uncontrolled disease. And for research purposes, defined it with visual analog scales. But for daily use, it's important to realize that if you see a patient that is absolutely fantastic and the mucosa looks nice, and the patient has hardly any symptoms, but he continuously uses steroids and antibiotics all the time, uh, the, the, the patient probably is still uncontrolled. All these data and ideas led to new care pathways. And just like in acute rhinosinusitis, all these care pathways are from self-care, primary care, uh, pharmacy to primary care to secondary and tertiary care. And you can look at the part of the graph where you actually belong. So patients, of course, always start with self-care. No patient ever goes to a GP without trying something themselves. Uh, saline spray, intranasal steroids, uh, if they're OTC. But for us and for the pharmacy, it's important to explain to the patient that antibiotics do not help in this uh, case and to avoid exacerbating factors. If the patient is then seen in the primary care, uh, again, the, the primary care will explain the importance of rinsing with saline, intranasal steroids, and educate the patient how to use the medication, how to rinse the nose, how to use the nasal spray in a proper way. Again, avoid antibiotics, and here, very important for all of us, but especially for uh, primary care, to check treatable traits and comorbidities. And with treatable traits, we mean all the things the patient can do to reduce the problem. For example, stop smoking, uh, have uh, look at the occupation of the patient, look at the allergies of the patient. So all the, the things we can treat or prevent to get the better situation in a chronic rhinosinusitis. And of course, also here we look at comorbidities like asthma. Then eventually patients are referred to ENT surgeons. Uh, and here I, I only want to look at the diffuse bilateral chronic rhinosinusitis, but you can find also here schemes for localized unilateral disease and for secondary. Uh, rhinosinusitis. But let's look finally at diffuse bilateral chronic rhinosinusitis because of course that's the form of disease we see most often. Very important to check and to discuss with the patient what is appropriate medical therapy. Does the patient really use nasal steroids? Is he rinsing his nose with saline? Many patients say yes, do no. We all know that. It's important to explain why it is so important that the mucus is part of the problem and that it has to be removed. We have to educate the patient for the technique and how to do it every day and reconsider um, uh, oral corticosteroids. Then after six to 12 weeks, we check whether the patient is actually better. Also that is very often forgotten. We send the patient back and do not see whether they actually improve. If they do not improve, we can do an additional uh, workup with CT scan, skin pick test, lab. Again, reconsider treatable traits. Are you still smoking? And whether the patient is compliant and then this is the really new thing of EPOS 2020. Now we ENT surgeons are going to think, is this a type two disease or is this a non-type two disease? And we're going to do different things. How do we know whether it's type two disease? That's pretty difficult. Uh, we can look at the phenotype. We can ask whether the patient has smell loss. That can be a sign of um, type two disease. We can ask whether the patient is intolerant to uh, NSAIDs or aspirin. We can ask whether the patient has asthma or atopy. We can look in the nose and see polyps or eosinophilic mucin. And we can do lab. 
And I, I'm sure there are many of you who never do a blood in a patient. So that is something really new that we have to start doing. We have to measure total IgE as a measure of inflammation in polyps, not as a, as a sign of uh, atopy, but as a sign of uh, <clears throat> uh, type two inflammation. And we have to measure blood eosinophils. If it is a type two disease, we give appropriate medical treatment, but we also want to give oral corticosteroids or FES. And eventually, if that all is not uh, enough, we want to try biologicals when they're available in our country, aspirin desensitization, taper schemes of systemic steroids and revision surgery. If the disease is non-type 2, and from a phenotypical point of view, we can think of that the main complaint is discharge and facial pain, less asthma, less atopy. When we look in the nose, we see purulence, not really polyps. We do lab, see normal IgE, no eosinophilia. Again, we start with appropriate medical treatment, but now we can think of, are, are, am I going to give long-term antibiotics? Am I going to do sinus surgery? And if all that's not enough, we have a whole list of treatments that have now proven to be effective, like rinsing with xylitol, or um, we have to think again whether it is not a secondary diffuse chronic rhinus sinusitis. So this division between non-type 2 and type 2 really changes the way we treat our patients. And then finally, my last two slides are about um, the indications for biological treatment. We now have two uh, biological treatments available in Europe. One is uh, anti-IL-4 alpha, a receptor alpha, which is dupilimab, uh, blocking IL-4 and IL-13. And the other one is anti-IgE, Zolaire, um, omalizumab. And within Euphoria and EPOS, we came for, uh, we suggested criteria for patients that may need a biological treatment. And we said, well, you know, you, you need to have a patient with bilateral polyps, because that's the indication for biologicals who have had surgery, appropriate surgery. If that's the case, check these five criteria. Evidence of type two inflammation. And we said that's either eosinophils in, in, the, in a biopsy or in the blood or a raised total IgE, need for systemic steroids or a contraindication to systemic steroids, significant impaired of quality of life. And we define that as a SNOT22 over 40. How many of you use a SNOT22 every day in their daily practice to ask how their patients are? important new thing to start to do if you're not doing it already. Significant loss of smell, and we define that as anosmia on a smell test. So not doctor, I can't smell, but actually use a smell, a smell test, sniffing sticks or an upset or whatever you like. And finally, a diagnosis of comorbid asthma. And we said, when do you have asthma? Well, to make it easy for ENT surgeons, when someone, a GP or a pulmonologist, decided that the patient need regular inhaled corticosteroids. I'll skip this. Um, you see that I really, really try to not go over 45 minutes uh, to summarize 450 pages. That is uh, one minute for every 10 pages. And you can see that that's an absolutely impossible task, but I don't have to do that task because if you go to one of these two websites, you can find either an executive summary, which is the first chapter of this supplement, about 40 pages, quite easy to read. Or if you're really, really a diehard, you can go and read the whole 460 pages and all the references and become a absolute pro in the treatment of chronic rhinus sinusitis. If you want to hear more than this uh, webinar, we sincerely hope, and this is really new because we just decided uh, it uh, last week, that we can meet each other in Thessaloniki on the ERS. We postponed it for a year 
and the new dates will be September 26 to 30. And I really, really hope that we can meet again in a normal uh, world where we can hug and raise a glass of wine um, and discuss all the beautiful aspects of our profession. Thank you very much for listening and I'm very happy to answer all the questions you had. Thank you very, very much for this brilliant presentation in a, at a glance, comprehensive and uh, detailed in regards to the new updates for the news in regards to the uh, EPOS guidelines uh, and for the for the explanation in regards uh, to the the specific importance of the blood tests in regards to the assessment of the patients. Uh, I think that is uh, should be mandatory. Just for those who don't know, I'm I'm sorry if I'm interrupting for one second. I at the time that I got my diagnosis for COVID-19, I wasn't able because of the guidelines. Uh, I wasn't able to have a nasopharyngeal swab. The only way that I could be assessed for that was from my blood count, in which my eosinophilic count was triple, and after that because of my D-dimer, because of my eosinophilic, then one of my colleagues raised his concern and said, well, look, I think that you should do a nasopharyngeal, nasopharyngeal swab, and then I would got my diagnosis. So blood tests should be mandatory to assess. In regard to this, let's start quickly with the questions. We have tons, so I think that we, we will not be able to, to reply to all them, but since uh, Professor Fukan said that we are going to meet each other in 2021, September, hopefully I will remind everyone, if you have any doubt, EPOS guidelines are free to access. If you go into the Rhinology page, you can just go there and download the manual. You can directly check out by yourself. But let's start for the question. We can go for three of them. And uh, this, the first one is coming from uh, China. Is uh, The question is, antileukotrients are still active in asthmatic and uh, chronic rhinosinusitis or not? Yeah, very good question. Uh, there is a meta-analysis in EPOS showing that um, leukotriene, uh, antileukotrients are uh, not effective in uh, uh, chronic rhinosinusitis sinusitis with nasal polyps. Of course, the problem is also always that they are effective in asthma or in certain forms of asthma, and that there are only uh, three or four studies done in nasal polyps, and that you can think that maybe there is a subgroup of patients that actually will react, but that we haven't done the right sort of studies to find that subgroup. So I will never say, uh, no, they're not effective, but I can say that the meta-analysis done on the studies that have been performed until now do not show a positive effect over placebo. The other question is coming from France, and the question is, uh, if a patient is scheduled for uh, biologic, does he have to continue nasal steroids? That's a very good question. I think at the moment uh, we say yes. Uh, we want to do appropriate medical treatment. So rinsing with saline, nasal steroids, um, and, uh, and have had surgery and then a biological. Uh, you can imagine that the additive effect of the nasal steroids uh, is helping the, to reduce the inflammation. But to be honest, we do not have data to actually prove that because all the studies that have been performed until now have looked at biologics on top of appropriate medical treatment, including nasal steroids. Now the question, more, two more, then we are over with this. Uh, coming from San Francisco, how many days after initial treatment is it suggested to request a radiology? How many days after? Initial treatment, it is suggested to request radiology. Oh yeah, that's an interesting difference between the US and Europe. That's why we <laughs> sort of look surprised and say, no, there is no. In, in Europe, we say, if the patient is well controlled, if there's no reason to think of doing surgery or that you're afraid of a complication, 
there's no reason to do a CT because the CTs can, um, uh, after treatment, uh, a, a, so a CT scan is radiation. Radiation is not good for you. Um, so in Europe, we say in general, the reasons to do a CT scan is you need a roadmap for surgery. You want to know where you are. And because of the very variable anatomy of the sinuses, we always want to have a CT scan when we operate. Or you're afraid the patient has a complication, a mucus seal, or another reason why you want to see the part of the sinuses that you cannot diagnose with an endoscope. Or very seldom you are convinced the patient has chronic rhinosinusitis, sinusitis, but you actually don't see anything with an endoscope. For example, you have a patient with a with an obstructed frontal sinus, eh, for, um, maybe after earlier surgery. And although the sinuses look absolutely beautiful, you cannot really look up into the frontal sinus and you think, well, I'm, I'm convinced the patient has pain there and it must be a chronic rhinus sinusitis. So for Europe, that are the three reasons. We do not have to do sinus uh, CT scans to prove our insurance companies that the patient has CRS. And we do not have to prove the patient that he has CRS. So we are quite strict in our use of uh, CT scans. And these, I think, are for most of us, the indications to do a CT scan. But if you want to know how the whole steering group thought about it, I think there are about seven questions on the use of CT scans in these different Delphi questionnaires in EPOS. Have a look at them and you see them uh, changing from almost everybody thinking that that's a, a, a real indication to make a CT scan, for example, a complication, to uh, a more diverse um, view where some felt it was really necessary and others uh, were not so keen to do a CT. Last question. I, I would like to know something about this. If I come from Brazil, and the question is nasal rinse or vibratil aerosol? Nasal rinse. <laughs> That's the short answer. The long answer is why nasal rinse? Um, you, uh, the studies from, uh, uh, among others, Richard Harvey has shown, uh, and also uh, PJ Warmold, that you need a large volume of uh, saline to actually be able to really rinse the sinuses. And I always explain it to my patients, say, if you wash your hands, uh, how much water do you need? Well, they say, well, you know, half a liter or 300 cc. Or, and say, well, your sinuses are as large as your hands. So if you just spray in a little amount of water, you cannot wash your hands with a little amount of water. You cannot wash your sinuses. So you need a lot of saline to wash the sinuses and also a lot of saline to get the uh, steroids that you put in those, uh, in the saline, uh, the, the nasal steroid drops. If you use those, you need quite a lot of saline to actually fill the sinuses with fluid to get the, uh, the steroids everywhere where they are supposed to go. Brilliant. And the explanation with the largest of the hand is, is pretty amazing. I like that part. So, we don't have the time anymore, so I'm very, very glad and thankful for your participation. If anyone would have some questions, I will try to submit a list of them uh, to to the attention of uh, Professor Fukens for this, and we will say uh, if we would have some times for uh, for a, for a reply because of her busy, 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 busy schedule. Thank you so much for your participation. I really hope to see each other, as you said, once again. Um, September. I hope it's going to be before that, but of course, uh, by the time we will see. Thank you again for your participation. I'm very glad once again and grateful, and I talk to you very, very soon. Thank you for the uh, to all the attendees, and uh, we will see next week with uh, Joseph Han. Uh, Professor Han is going to talk about implantable devices, drugs, and the management of nasal polyps. Thank you again. And I'll talk to you very, very soon. Goodbye. Thank you, Puya, and thank everybody for listening. Bye-bye.